Hi, I'm Mary Windischar and I'm from Alameda, California. I started in television as a program producer, doing children's shows, talk shows. I also did magazine shows like Evening Magazine. When I did talk shows, it was both in Baltimore and in California, and they were called People Are Talking, and my claim to fame is that Oprah Winfrey was on the show that I produced in Baltimore. After I had my babies, I changed sides of the camera. So I became someone who was on television instead of a person who produced television. And the show that I did was called Inside China, and I was on that show for 10 years on PBS stations all over the country. Because of Inside China, I got the chance to see the Silk Road. I got to ride a camel. I got to see craftspeople doing things you don't see any place else, not just in China, but in the world. Things like walls of caves painted in ancient times. We see movies like The Last Emperor, and we see the Forbidden City, and I got to go there. I got to see where they filmed that, but not just that, where the emperors actually lived. Working on shows about China, I learned what it's like to be part of a group and to care more about the group than you do about yourself. There's a word in Chinese, it's pongyo, and that's friends, because I made a lot of friends in China. And I think of it as a culture that's different, but good. The people are just like us, and we will be united with them as long as we remember that we love art, that we love our children, and that we have a shared history. We will be going to Xiamen. It's in Fujian province, and it is on the Taiwan Strait. It is right across from Taiwan, and we'll be there for 12 days. I've been able to see some beautiful art when I've traveled, and I'm gonna to get to see some in Xiamen as well. We'll get to see opera, and this is folk opera. And then, art you can hold. This will be art that's called lacquer art. Food is an exciting part anytime you travel. In Xiamen, we will taste the local cuisine. Seafood is supposed to be amazing. It's right there on the sea. We'll also find out about tea ceremonies and how to make a perfect cup of tea. Also, there's a night market where you taste exotic food. When we go to Xiamen, it's gonna be really wonderful because there's a university there. Well, it's been there since the early 1900s, but it's a beautiful setting with architecture and buildings that reflect that. We're also gonna to go to an island where there is no cars, there is no traffic or anything like that. I haven't been to China since the Olympics. That's almost 10 years, and I cannot wait to go back. I'm gonna to get to see a brand new place. I have to be honest, I never even heard of it before. And taste food I've never tasted before. See sights I've never seen before. This will be so much fun. I gotta go pack. First day in Xiamen, we got to go to Gulangyil Island. We started out on a ferry. 
On the ferry, you'll see a skyline that's so modern. And then you also see this beautiful small island. It's lush. Gulangyu Island is a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site, and that happened in 2017. This is less than a square mile in area. There's only 20,000 people living here, but it is a major domestic tourist destination. It attracts more than 10 million visitors per year. That makes it China's second most visited tourist attraction after the National Museum in Beijing. There are no cars on this island, maybe some electric buggies or something, but everyone is walking. And I thought maybe it would be like Venice, but it was more like Disneyland. People everywhere. Do Americans know about this island? Because I think I'm the only American here. I also saw a church. Nobody loves a bride like I love a bride. Three of them standing outside the church, posing for their wedding pictures. We walked up to the church itself where there was a big scroll. And on the scroll was the Genesis thing about how man and woman belong together. And then I looked down and I saw Corinthians 13. And um, those were my wedding vows. I read the scroll and I was very moved. I remembered my wedding. I remembered wanting to do the things that Corinthians 13 says. I actually took a picture so I could remember everything. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. I cried a little bit. I missed my husband a little bit. As you walk around, as you drive around, you see different sights. You'll see the beach. There are beautiful trees. You feel like you're with nature. I saw banyan trees like you'd see in Hawaii. And sunlit rock. There's a sign on the way. It says, if you haven't been to sunlit rock, you haven't seen Xia Man. And it's absolutely right. The views are incredible. This red roofs, those are where the people live, where the businesses take place here on the island. They're over 100 years old, those homes, and many were built by overseas Chinese that look like buildings you might see in the States or in England. On the other side of the water is the newest part of Xiamen. Those buildings are only 30 years old. As you can see, the contrast between old and new is huge. Xiamen is in southeastern Fujian, China. It covers an area of 720 square miles, and it's about 1.5 times the size of Los Angeles. Its population is 3,920,000 people. Well, that's almost four times the population of San Francisco. I felt very surprised to see how modern Xiamen is. Because it's a city that's smaller than Shanghai or Beijing, I expected something provincial. And it is a provincial town, but it is not small. This city is still being built. The new part of the city has many, many beautiful buildings, but they're still going up. I feel like I'm seeing someplace I've never seen before. I'm on the stage at the Gutza Opera Company in Xiamen, and I've always said art is what's going to bring the world together, and today was a perfect example. I got to meet Miss Sue, the star of the show. But she's not just a star, she's a mom like me. And so we got a chance to talk about our babies. She has a baby 13 months old, and then she gave me a picture of herself. So this is her performing in the opera. I feel like this is gonna be one of the best shows I've ever seen just because I know the people. When I walked into the makeup room, one of the male performers said, 
Hello. 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 <laughs> and it was great because he said it in my language. I felt very welcome. And then I saw a makeup artist putting makeup on another female, but who was playing a male character. They put tape and spirit gum along the head of a female performer, tied all this yarn back that was attached to the tape, and her face went like this. And then all of a sudden she became a man. We got to see the performance. The first one we saw was the gentleman I told you who said hello to me. And all of a sudden, when I had met him, his performance became so much more to me. I could see in his eyes how he felt. And then we saw a beautiful performance with Miss Sue and her partner. It was just a love story. Then I noticed what I had seen in the male gentleman's eyes happening in their eyes too, and I understood more what was going on. I didn't know in opera that you could even connect with somebody and their eyes, but to see this and to understand how much human emotion was just out here on the stage, it's incredible. I've seen a lot of performances, a lot of theater, nothing like this ever. It's more about the raw emotions of real people. And that's what we saw. By the way, I haven't even told you about the music because there was a beautiful musical live instruments here. And we saw two stringed instrument, bamboo rod and palm tree drum. And then there was a guitar like instrument as well. These are the two instruments that specialize in the sounds of human crying, human sadness. When they play together along with the singer, I think magic happens. Miss Sue, I met her, I cheered for her. So when she fell in love, I was happy. But then she sang a song, like she'd lost a child. When you saw her eyes, I saw her well up, I saw tears come. And I thought, wow, she's believing every single thing she's saying. And then a single tear rolled down her cheek. I believed everything I was seeing. At the end of the performance, I felt I should comfort her, and so I went to give her a big hug. And she hugged me back and that comforted me because I too felt the same emotion that she had up on the stage.
that's why art is important because you realize you're not the only one feeling something. And you realize that all human beings have the same, the same feelings. And that's what connects us. So I'm enriched because I got to hear a beautiful story and see beautiful artists at work. Earlier today, we saw the influence that overseas Chinese or expatriates can have on an entire city. In fact, an entire country. Citizen, and he lived in Singapore. And in Singapore, oh, wow. he made his money in Singapore and Malaysia. We met Mr. Chin at the Jimei School Village and he told us all about the founder, Mr. Tankagi, of this complex that includes elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and several universities. We started at the Turtle Garden. You see a long hallway. This hallway leads to the monument. But as you walk, you see pictures of life in the 1900s. And you see Mr. Tonkagi with political leaders because he had a great association with many of the leaders who formed China. You also see carvings up above the pictures. This is hand-done art made to beautify this village. We also went to the monument to the soldiers who tried to save Jimei Village and built only with stone. And at the end is the tomb of Mr. Tankagi. Mr. Tankagi was a Chinese citizen who then became an expatriate. And he lived for a long time in Singapore. All he cared about was China. All the money he earned, he put toward making the village that we saw there. He wanted to educate the population of China because he said that is the foundation of a strong nation. And that school started in the early 1900s. It's a private school and it's going strong today. The architecture was very different from itself. So it wasn't all in the traditional Chinese pagoda look. There were some modern things as well. He also made a hall for the returnees, the people who come back to China who were expatriates. As you walk toward the center, there's a plaza all the way around a central building. And this is where the returnees and the family were to stay. In the center of the courtyard is a building. And you walk through the doors and right in front of you is a statue of Mr. Tankagi. And people came there to have celebrations for him or about his work. My dad was a teacher. My daughter's a teacher. They both taught in public schools. Both experience the difficulty that comes from teaching. To hear that people in China are funding private schools so that people can go and learn the ancient traditions and that they can move into the world today is inspiring. And it's also inspiring to hear that the overseas Chinese from all over the world contribute to this. That's the value of education. I was inspired because I think that the founder of this school understood that if populace is not educated, the country has no backbone. And I think that that's what all teachers are trying to do, and I want to support them, and we all should. When you look at the skyline of Xiamen, you see cranes everywhere. And that's a sure sign that the economy is booming. Well, China has joined other countries in a coalition called BRICS. It stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. There are other countries as well. They are having their ninth summit right here in Xiamen. And at it, they'll discuss the challenges of being a newly industrialized country and having a fast-growing economy. Since 2009, the BRICS nation have met annually at formal summits, and China will be hosting the ninth BRICS summit. It'll be in Xiamen International Conference and Exhibition Center on September 3rd, 4th, 5th. These five nations, as of 2015, have a combined national gross domestic product of 16.6 .6 trillion US dollars. So that's 
approximately 22% of the gross world product. They represented over 3.6 billion people. That's 40% of the world's population. The BRICS nations have received both praise and criticism from numerous commentators. Anyway, bilateral relations among BRICS nations have mainly been conducted on the basis of non-interference, equality, and mutual benefit. Now, we'll talk about Fujian cuisine and specifically what you'll find in Xiamen. Didao Zen has a very modern look, especially because it's a restaurant that represents the ancient cuisine. We went into the kitchen to start. First, the chef gets a whisk that looks like a broom, and he washes out the wok, and then he pours in some oil, and he deep fries something. Then that goes into a sieve where the oil drains off, and then he washes the wok. So there's a cooking tip. I didn't know that you would do that between each of the different ingredients. Then come vegetables. We've got carrots. We've got the meat, pink shrimp, and what I found out was this was all a mixture for spring rolls. Everybody's had spring rolls. Filipinos serve them, Vietnamese serve them, but these are freshly made, I think, to order. There they are, ready for you when you want them. And then we add peppers. You would see flames just leaping up into the air. Smoke, it was quite a production. One thing he did add though that I've never seen really in action was the soy sauce. Now this soy sauce is very special because this comes only from this region and they marinate it in fish and also put some peppers in it as well. Then we move from the kitchen to the dining room to taste the food. Mm. It tastes so fresh. I don't think I've ever had a spring roll where it's made on the spot. It's very good. I don't really taste hot sauce, and that's kind of what made me think it might taste like a Mexican roll, but mmm. Mm. It's so good. So satay, that's something from Southeast Asia, but here it is, we're finding it in Xiamen. It's a really nice combination of many different, what I think of as cultures. Chinese culture's in here, Xiamen culture, also something from Southeast Asia. It sure gives me a comfort food feeling. And the climax of the meal is stewed lobster with soy sauce, very special soy sauce. And it's supposed to boost the flavor of the lobster and make it more delicious. <laughs> and try this. Oh. The soy sauce makes a huge difference. I taste more lobster. It does really maximize the flavor. This one, it just sparkles on your tongue. It's just the way you want it to taste. And when you have the challenge in your mouth of the peppers and you have the saltiness of the soy sauce, I think that brings it alive so much more than to simply steam it. This is Emperor Tea Land, and this is a place where people come for gong fu tea. And what that means is making tea with skill. This is a practice that goes back to the 1700s. The tea ceremony itself can be up to 18 steps. This harp-like instrument is played for you, and when the water pours, you hear trickle, trickle, trickle from the instrument, and a beautiful young woman also narrates everything that's going on. And another part of the ceremony is the dance-like quality that the person who performs the ceremony has. So her beautiful hands move with the words and they just mesmerize you. They almost hypnotize you. 
As a matter of fact, the people who do this ceremony are dancers. They are dancers that are identified through a partnership with a dance studio that Emperor Tealand has, and they train them up to two years to perform the ceremony. When it comes to drinking tea, I've been missing three steps. If I'm using loose tea, first I need to wake it up and pour the water in, and then that part doesn't get used. Then I have to be sure to look at the tea, and then I have to smell the tea, almost like wine if the character of the tea tastes the same when it's smelled and when it's drank. One of the nice things about this cup of tea is that it's a real look into someone else's culture. I think I will be drinking tea differently and I think I will showing others how to drink it differently too. So many things in this world change. People go, jobs change, even the weather is something that's changing. What's so nice about this experience is that it makes us appreciate what we have in the present moment, what we have right now. It was time for indulgence. We walked into Zhengzhou An village and it was so crowded, like Disneyland. Bright colors. So many people, and the indulgence came from some of the food we tasted. This is beef, so we'll see how it tastes. Street snacks. Mmm. Mmm. It's good. It has cumin on it. Oh, this tastes like China. Mmm, and how? Mmm, mmm. And how? Hot. It's hot. <clears throat> it's not just cumin. It has some hot, like hot peppers too. <laughs> As you walk along, you're smelling that deep fried goodness. There was deep fried squid on a stick, spiraling potatoes on a stick. I was really mesmerized by all the fresh fruit. Many, many mango dishes, many cantaloupe, cold things like ice cream being made right there in front of your eyes in dry ice. And so you see this smoke wafting all over the place. You always feel like you're at a party, really, because everybody's maneuvering around each other, everybody's eating, having a good time. The other thing that we saw as we went through was little doorways where you could go into courtyards. And we did go into one and met a Kung Fu master. Master Tsai started out with a little tea ceremony and I got a chance to talk to him about how he's perfected his Kung Fu. He said it took three years just to get the basics down. And he's been doing it for 26 years. When we were speaking to him, he was full of personality, he tried to speak English a little bit, but the minute he stepped into the courtyard where he was going to give his demonstration, he became a focusing machine. He warmed up and insisted on warming up, and then it was time for the performance. And it was one minute of strength, concentration, acrobatics. <laughs> that was really awesome to see him, to see his craft, to see his talent, to see what he's worked 26 years to be able to do. We walked down a couple more steps into another courtyard. We walked into a darkened room, 
and you could smell the candle. And up in the front were two performers. Dong Tzu, he's playing the guitar, and Guo Tzu, and he plays the drum and harmonica. And they were making some beautiful music. He moved on to another song. In fact, he sang one in English. It really did feel like wonderful folk music from the heart. They're very passionate about their music. It's all original. The second thing that they really put into their performances is an appreciation for the man who owns that bar, who is putting them up. They live there and providing to them this place to perform and to share this music that's so much from their own heart, from their own soul. This morning, we went high tech. We paid a visit to Tianma Microelectronics. Back in the States, we all use our tablets, we all use phones, and some of us even have refrigerators that have a screen on it. I can't believe how many things have screens now. So we wanted to go behind that Made in China label and see if there were real people, real hands, real brains, real faces that would help us understand what it took to get that screen in our hand. And so we walked into the company and there were two guys there, they were techies. In that, they think I know what they're talking about and I don't. I majored in drama, but they were pretty good about explaining everything that was going on there, so I'll try to explain it to you. Walking through the showroom is like walking through the future. I look into the future by looking at the past. Remember your flip phone and how much you loved it because it didn't get scratched, because it was small? It's back. Look at this screen on a phone that actually folds right back up again. I was pretty surprised. It's actually a touch phone as well. So you make your call, you touch it as you, as you need to, and then you fold it up and it's safe from scratches. Nice and small, fits in your pocket, fits in your purse. And then the other thing that this can also be is a tablet. So you're using your tablet, you finish up with that, fold it, it's protected, and then it also becomes your phone. Almost everything in the manufacturing process is automated, but there are so many people there involved in getting that automation going. They are involved in the past, the present, and the future. The ones who work in the past are the people who do the inspections once the robotic machines create the product. And the product, by the way, are screens or monitors that show video. And these screens are only under 10 inches. They're one of the top producers of screens in the world. These screens are used for your cell phone, for monitors for medical equipment, on your iPad or your tablet. The people who work in the present are the engineers who solve problems as they occur as the manufacturing process is taking place. And there are also software engineers who are working on the future. They are coming up with new products and improvements on existing products that we are all using every day. This is technology and methodology that was developed in the United States and then perfected by ingredients by factories like Tian Ma. It seems unbelievable to me until I stop and think about the fact that engineers made in China helped me to understand something I had no idea I could ever grasp.
This morning we visited Meitu. It is a technology company all about, they say, making life beautiful. And they do that by making their users beautiful and using high-tech facial mapping technology. Meitu is an app that you can download. There are several apps. So one of them is just something that makes your pictures prettier. So here's a couple of pictures of me. And um, let's see, this one's not too bad. I think my skin looks kind of porcelain. My eyes look a little bit bigger. All right, <laughs> take a look at that one. I think that the light is soft, but I do think that you see less wrinkles. It's kind of like a cosmetic thing, like cosmetic surgery or something. Not only do they smooth out and make your skin beautiful, somehow the cheeks get rosier, the eyes get brighter and darker. And then there's another one that they throw in little tiny pieces of animation, so a hat on you. Or flowers. Or a little sign, or something like that. Hello. Why don't you have some tea right now? It's very delicious. It's so fabulous. I just love it. You are really lost really in oh. dancing. It was fun. It really was. It took you out of yourself. It just gave you a break from reality. Today we visited the Nanputua Temple. This was founded in the Tang Dynasty and these days over 70,000 people come here every week and over 130 million people visit every year. We started at the Heavenly Hall. And the first thing you see is the Laughing Buddha. This is the Buddha that represents the future. People come here with offerings. so flowers and fruit. To the side of the Laughing Buddha are four gods, and the four gods protect the Buddha and us, the visitors. The gods all have these threatening looks on their face. They're powerful and they're, I guess, trying to threaten evil. Old people are here, young people are here. And when you look at their faces while they're kneeling or something, you know there's something important in their head. You know that they really are feeling something and they don't care who's watching them. This belief really does mean a lot to people. This belief must make people's lives better because they are so passionate here. After the Heavenly Hall, we went to the Mahavira Hall. There were six Buddhas in an altar, and then there was a rail, and then there were kneelers. This is where the monks chant. All of them chant at least one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. The one in the center is Shakamuni. But the one that got my attention was the one over on the right side. That is the medicine Buddha. And that's important to me because there's been a lot of sickness in my family. And so I wanted to pray or to just chant to that Buddha and to just hope that things get a little better. And one of the things that the Buddha offers you is when there's darkness, he helps you see the light. After the Mahavira Hall, we went to the Dharma Hall. This is a place that houses some rare national treasures. And this is something that you'll get to see on this show, but you won't get to see if you come here yourself. You'll find here books full of writings and teachings from Buddha. You'll find statues made in the Ming Dynasty 500 years ago. The detail was so exquisite. The artist only made 18 of them in the first place. Only three are left and one's in Beijing, another is in another town, one of the province capitals, and the other is here, right here. We got to see it. We got to find out how this practice was celebrated in art. When we were done here, I don't want to say I was a Buddhist, but I felt a peace. I felt a calm. I understood why being aware of what's going on right here, right now, can make you happier. 
Because when you focus on that, you can't worry about the future. You can only be right here, right now. Earlier today, we went to Xiamen University. So when you walk in there, you see buildings that don't exactly make sense. On the bottom, they're Western, but on the top, they are Chinese. So they have the lacquered roofs, they have the tilted eaves. It's a little disconcerting to see that kind of a difference until you find out that they were designed by Mr. Tan Kagib. He is the founder of the university. He started it in 1921. 16 years later, the government took over. So when you look at the first set of buildings, it's a set of five different buildings all together. You'll see walkways, common walkways, that connect all five buildings. And this architecture is repeated four or five times throughout the campus. There's a beautiful lake in the middle of the campus, beautiful trees surrounding it. And this lake is where people gather, but there's also concerts there. Xiamen University feels like an ordinary campus in another way, a huge stadium. This stadium holds 22,000 people, and they have soccer games, they have baseball games there too. What is different about this university for me was the respect and honor that they pay to Mr. Tankagi. They're also following and taking his example, which is what he was all about. He donated so much money to schooling because he thought, if I'm not going to do it, I can't ask anybody else to do it. And so the alumni associations for this school are so active, so strong. And in fact, I guess the class of 1990 built a building. So that's one of the main differences of this campus from others in the United States. But when it's all said and done, those young faces looking around to see, can I go here? Can I get into this university? Can I make the grade? And their parents, right beside them, hoping that they can, felt just like what I'm used to. Over the last couple of days, we've been to a university, Buddhist temple, so time for a brain break. We're gonna go shopping at Zhongshan Lu. Lu means street in Chinese. This is a shopping district like nothing I've ever seen. And on this street, you will see so many stores. I couldn't even count them. Jewelry stores, tea shops, clothing stores, wonderful food. It's filled with people in their Sunday best, whether it's Sunday or not. And just enjoy what we all love, which is shopping on vacation. So I saw somebody making etching on silver right at the front of the store, and I got myself a bracelet. Part of what is good about it is that they, for free, carved into it my name on the inside, and then they also put in the name of the city, Xiamen. So I have a really nice souvenir. I have to tell you what I loved the most was looking at the people. That there's lots of babies and little kids and everybody's happy. And as I walked along, there were a bunch of girls and they said hello to me. And they started introducing themselves one by one in English. Hi, Peggy. My name is Mary. What is your name? So I got to meet these kids. They were so proud to speak English to me. And we all took a picture together, and I will never forget it. It is so wonderful just to meet people and feel like you belong. As I walked down the street, I tried so hard to think of a place that's like this in America. And I really couldn't think of anything like this. A little bit like New Orleans, because the architecture reminded me of New Orleans in that the buildings were about the same heights you'll find in the French Quarter. 
they had some little tiny iron balconies on the outside. And then down from there, you'll see all the neon signs. Enough shopping. My budget can't handle it. So tomorrow, art. We'll get to see some lacquer thread sculpture. Sunglasses. You are never fully or fashionably dressed until you're wearing them, or so I hear. Well, today we got to visit the Boulogne Eyeglass Factory. This is a place where they make more than three million pairs of eyeglasses a year. They sell for between 80 and 800 dollars, and they're the number one producer of eyewear in China. We started looking at some of the machines. This is one making a mold for the plastic part of the stem of the glasses. This machine can also make a mold for the front of the eyeglasses. Also, they make wireframe glasses. Sheets of plastic are used with the molds, and then rough versions of the stems are produced by this machine. The fronts of the glasses are created in this machine, where plastic is molded and then shaved into shape, layer by layer. See, here's the rough draft and then this is the middle draft. Here's how the rough drafts are perfected. The stems are put into the sander after they've been warmed to soften them up. In the past, this factory was used by other designers for outsourcing. However, Boulogne has created its own brand now. The glasses will be sold on the new Silk Road to other developing economies. Once the parts are all created, they are assembled. This involves adding a little glue and metal solder and a lot of precision. Here, the five-sided wire eyepiece is connected. And here, the nose piece is added. It connects both sides. But back to the factory, they still have to be assembled once all those parts are made. So this is the final assembly line. Some of them are doing some quality testing. Some are putting screws on and assembling the glasses together. Others look at the schematic right there in front of them, and then they put the glass on top of it and measure to see if, if it is exactly as it was designed to be. We talked to one guy who said he does 200 pairs of glasses every single day. Their marketing strategy is to use recognizable faces such as celebrities, supermodels, actors, in fact, and Hathaway is the uh, spokesperson for 2017. So, here's the pair of glasses I picked. Do I look like a celebrity? Which one? After lunch, we got to stop by Tsai Lacquer Thread Sculpture Craft, where we saw beautiful art and how it was made. When I first walked into the showroom, I felt like I was in a jewelry store. Gold is everywhere. It is a showroom that is filled with vases and wall hangings and colors and texture. It is wonderful art that combines embroidery, sculpture, and painting. There were plates that had the astrological signs for the Chinese year, so I saw a ram, because I'm a ram. If I were to pick any astrological sign, I would pick the dragon. The dragon was so awesome. It starts, if you'd like to buy something, at about $40 for a plate. This piece is particularly spectacular, and every raised thing that you see on here, from the medallions on the elephants to the decoration in the girl's hair, is lacquer and it is spectacular because there is nothing but 24 karat gold foil over the tops of everything or genuine silver as well. So we see here there's a Tibetan young woman and also elephants. If you look closely you can see that there are I think five elephants in there. This piece took eight months to finish and the cost for it is $50,000. Imagine getting that through customs. Here's the process. First step is to carve something, and it's carved out of wood. Then, 
that vessel, if it's a vase or a plate, gets colored. The next step is adding the lacquer. Now, this is done with tiny, narrow threads of lacquer that are placed onto the vessel or the plate, and they are put on there with the end of a brush and then cut off with a sharp X-Acto knife, or I think in the old days they used a piece of bamboo. Once that's done, the fourth step becomes painting over the lacquer with gold foil, and what you get is something that's multidimensional. Every single thing you see on one of the vases or the paintings is actually lacquer, even if it's an inch high. And it's all done with the masters that I got to meet. In a back room, there were about six of them all working together at a bench. And when you walked by and saw their work, it was humbling. <laughs> but I still went in there and tried. So the first thing we did was take a piece of the lacquer, so it's just like a lump of clay in a way, and roll it out. Now I pictured it being rolled out like a noodle, but it's not. I am rolling out the lacquer. This lacquer is made with bricks, old, old bricks, and tongue oil, and also lacquer, which is tree sap. And my job is to, uh, I, to just gently roll these uh, lumps of clay and make it a tiny, tiny thread. These loops of lacquer, after you've made them, you twirl them onto a pencil-like object. Then unroll them once you're putting it on the plate or the sculpture. We saw some unpainted examples of lacquer on plates. It's beautiful. It doesn't even need the gold foil. You really do see the precision that is used in placing those perfectly formed strings of lacquer. We then came upstairs to the museum. And everything was unique. Everything was special. I looked at a piece that was done by the 11th generation. The first figure you see, he's not dressed very elegantly, he doesn't have any shoes on, and he's resolute, and he's leading the other two guys in. The second figure probably is the general or the king. The general looks fearless. He is completely decorated. He has a warrior's robe on, and the detail on this thing is exquisite. Everything is balanced. They look like big jewels all over what he's wearing. And again, that beautiful texture with the threaded lacquer, it looks rich. It looks like this is the person that's adorned by the kingdom. And then there's the guy behind him, and I think that he is the soldier. He's carrying the flag, so you know he's into it. When you look at that flag that he's carrying, you can feel the wind. And you see the detail on that flag. There's not one millimeter without some sort of lacquer thread on it. And then we started looking at the work of the gentleman who is the 13th generation. And he's taken this to a whole new level. We saw a vase, and around it are chameleons climbing into the vase. Those chameleons were a little too real for me. I mean, I know they were gold, but they had the scales that you'd see on a real chameleon. With the detail that he provided, it's the next generation of this kind of art. In ancient times, the Silk Road was used to distribute art, silk, maybe even food. Now, with the new Silk Road coming in, this is the art that will be distributed to emerging economies.
Today is our last day in Xiamen and we decided to go back to Gulangyu Island and take a look and see if we could find the American footprint here. So we went to a former American consulate. It was built in 1934 and when you get there, you see a giant double stairway. And then those two join and go up to the consulate itself. When you get to the top of the stairs, you'll see brick that is both yellow and red and they alternate. Then you look up and there's a the consulate. It's a grand building. It has Greek pillars on two different sides. Shuttered windows. And the building itself is brick. There's also white stucco that matches the shutters. And it all feels so American, so colonial. It's just like what you'd see in Williamsburg. It is really a beautiful consulate. And right now its job is to house art exhibits. Next we saw the Anshan building, and it was built by Seventh-day Adventist missionaries in 1934. It was designed by an American architect, but built by the Chinese. It started out as a chapel, and it spent four years as a chapel, and then it became the combined middle schools for both boys and girls. And then finally, it became a nursing home for senior citizens, and Seventh-day Adventists to this day run that nursing home. And when it was given to the Chinese, the owner said all he wanted was one small area rub. This trip exceeded my expectations. To be able to see the ways that we're the same and to see the ways that we're different and to understand that it's a place where they've just, people love people. For me, the highlights of the trip include the opera. We saw and met a real person, just like us, who then went out and killed it on the stage. I was also really moved at the Buddhist temple because there's calm there, because there's peace there. Shopping's part of traveling. We just have to be willing to admit it. And to do that, but also get to know people a little bit and see some fun sights that you might not see in America. It was also a big treat for me. If you've never been to Shaman, here are some bullet points for you. Culture, academics, delicious, fabulous food, amazing views, and art. At the end of the trip, I feel like I can go anywhere and have the time of my life because when I travel now, I know how to connect with people. And it just takes, in Chinese, two words. Ni hao, that means hello. I just have to smile. I just have to say hello. And I can go anywhere I want to go.